Bill King joining us, King of College Football Talk, Nashville Sports Radio, 6 to 9, good friend of halftime. Day 3 of Media Day, Bill, means uh, you already got to hear Nick Saban speak to the media, and I guess he's pretty close, if not already done, with his entire two-hour, 45-minute session. And uh, some interesting things for him to say, uh, not the least of which is that he had a lot of numerous doctors come to speak to his team to get them over uh, the vaccinated threshold, over 90% or close to 90% of his players. And you kind of knew, you know, with the example of North Carolina State baseball that you can point to, I guess I, by this time I'm surprised that only six of the 14 teams are, are you know, quote-unquote fully vaccinated. I think the ACC mentioned today half of their 14. I would assume it's by, by, the, by the start of the season, Bill, like I would think all 14 SEC teams are past that threshold. Do, would you, do you agree with what we're hearing here six weeks before the season starts? Yeah, I, I don't have any private insight into it. But, yeah, I, I don't think I'd be surprised if we get to games and it turns out teams were 50 percent vaccinated and it's caused a big problem. I would maybe I'm naive, but I and I'm not a big telling people what to do guy when it comes to the vaccine, the vaccine. So I don't want to sound that way either, but I'd be surprised if that's an issue. Well, again, all you got to point to is what happened to NC State. And, yep. you know, if they, if they want to make it about the team, you know, we had Tom Hart on earlier, and he made the point it's a, you know, and it's at the same time where we're having this name, image, and likeness conversation about players getting their due and, and money and, and, and how that filters down to the team and, and how the locker room dynamic can change. But then you've got this other end of it where, you know, you, the, the whole team has to have this idea that, you know, if we're going to maybe make it to a national championship or maybe to a bowl game or anything like that, you know, we can't afford to have any possible forfeits, you know. And although there haven't been any announcements from Greg Sankey about forfeits, it does seem that that's on the table if nobody, if a team can't show up for a game. Yeah, there's nowhere to put it. And, and I get it. Now, <clears throat> can I use a story? that I'm wondering if we are going to read about at some point. And that would be we're we're into the season and some reporter gets a scoop that a depth chart position was determined. The players were 50-50 in performance. But the depth chart position was determined because one was vaccinated and the other one wasn't. What kind of storm is that going to be? I mean, it it will cause some type of ruckus, but at the same time, these players know what is expected of them and what they have to do to stay on the field. And we're in the middle of a pandemic, and if the coaches and everybody's telling you that you need to yeah. you need to get back vaccinated, and you regard whatever your personal reason is for not doing so, don't be shocked if it, if we decide to go with somebody else because we know we can guarantee we can count on him every week. Yeah, and it's, uh, again, it's polarizing, but that could very well be the case. Uh, and I don't think that'll be a common story, but something like that probably somewhere will arrive. Yeah, I, I'm sure I'm sure it probably will. It's just a matter of time for when it happens. Uh, outside of the COVID stuff, and I guess a team that is 100% um, COVID vaccinated with Vanderbilt, due to the fact that every student has to be vaccinated to attend the private university. Uh, Clark Lee spoke today. Uh, did he give any more confidence in uh, throughout the media and throughout fans of maybe Vanderbilt won't be as bad as we all expect them to be? Yeah, it's tough to say. I'm here every day, so I probably see more quotes from him than most people would just by virtue of where I live. But, it's, it's a tough situation. Now, they're allowing him staff that I've never seen Vanderbilt have before. They're allowing him to spend money, facilities, $300 million worth of overall athletic department improvements. That's not typical of Vanderbilt. Mm-hmm. They, they usually make those promises and then don't do it. And this time it looks like they're following through. They do have a good quarterback in Ken Seals. They say that it's a competition at quarterback because – Frankly, Vanderbilt's been so bad, they probably want to send that message. He's their starter. He had a really good freshman year. You can build around him. Outside of that, guys, there's very little talent. And it's going to be tough for a while at Vanderbilt. 
Bill, I know you uh, you know Mike Leach fairly well. You did uh, you've done a lot of yep. radio with him uh, previously, and everybody's anticipating his his appearance in Uber today. Just because it's Mike Leach might not have anything to do with the university he represents. So, uh, because, you know what what do you expect from from him today? Just a little more of the same, and, and outside of that too, you know what what do you expect out of Mississippi State in his second year? Expectations are down, which is perfect for Mike. This is when Mike is at his best. Started off with an LSU win. We all thought that predicted something. Mm -hmm. It didn't predict anything other than it was a big lie. LSU's not very good either. And when everything is kind of quiet, that's when he is the brilliant mad scientist. Now, again, I'm not making some bold prediction about their year. But that's when he will excel. The quarterback will have a big year. These events like this, he's just going to be a goofball. He's going to give the people what they want. This goofball thing, guys, isn't the way he is, really. People think it is. He just does this. He's so smart. He's perfect. Uh, but behind the scenes, he's dead bleeping serious. And he's a brutal disciplinarian. And uh, I think he's had to go through some of that here over the last year to get this thing point in the right direction. But you'll get the silly Mike Leach probably something. Well, I mean, he knows what people are expecting, and, and I think he kind of sure. he, he plays to that by now, and that's part of, of the genius. Does. You know, and on the other side of, of, an, of being an interesting personality, Mark Stoop speaks at Kentucky yesterday. Uh, Kentucky feels like, I don't know if I want to use the term dark horse necessarily, because no one's quite sure outside of Georgia in the east of, of you know, what you might have there. But it does feel like they're they're all they're going to be good on the line on both sides of it. You know, they've got transfers that are battling for the quarterback position. They got they're good at running back. Is this a year that you could see Kentucky rise a little bit in the east, maybe not win the division, but you know, contend and maybe give Georgia a hard time. Yeah, you know, just a couple of years ago they did that. And it came down to the Georgia game and they're never good enough on paper. So win that Georgia game, but they did beat Florida that year. They shouldn't be better than Florida. I, I could see them at number three. They're not balanced on offense. Now, that's one of the quarterback items is we've got to become – they've got two stud running backs, guys, that can play anywhere. Uh, they've got a physical offensive line. They've probably produced offensive linemen for the next level as well as anybody in the SEC last couple of years, and they still have talent there. Plus, you mentioned the transfer. But they're not balanced passing in the passing game, and that's a problem right here for them. And that's why I don't think I would place them ahead of Florida mm. overall. Back to the west side of the SEC, wrapping up today's uh, day three at SEC Media Days. Uh, Jimbo Fisher, when you talk about Mike Leach not having that much pressure on him down in Startville, Jimbo should start to feel the pressure, and the expectations are pretty high. Is, is he going to be finally get A&M over that threshold into the CFP? Is he going to be the first Saban disciple to dethrone King Nick? Or I mean, wh what is his season going to look like? Oh, I think they're arguably, you could say they're, along with Georgia, the number two team. If you just eliminate division, mm -hmm. you can argue that. Uh, Haynes King, probably the quarterback. They are, just mentioned Kentucky, Isaiah Spiller, and they have really good depth at running back. They are studs at running back. They've got some good receivers that ought to explode as well this year, and they've recruited well overall, as you guys know. Are they good enough to supplant Alabama? I don't ever pick that until I see somebody. Now, could that one loss, if that is indeed, guys, their only loss, could that get them in the playoff? It might. I mean, it might, it, it, it might not be likely, but it could. Could they be good enough to be a top four type team? It's possible. I don't quite think they're that. I think they're more top seven or eight good, but under the right scenario, it might happen. But the big deal is quarterback Haynes King and, and having a good year there, and it's probably who it's going to be. Uh, so tomorrow, Sam Pittman speaks 1030 just before we get on the air bill. You know, and this is the first yeah. time he's in front of the cameras and the SEC media day setting. He's he's really great to listen to. Got a sense of humor. Yeah. You know, he's a little understated about things. Um, you know, he won't be up there saying crazy things and stuff. I wonder from from your perspective as a host, um, 
What do you think about Coach Pittman's personality as far as being up on the stage and in front of cameras like he will be tomorrow? It's just totally comfortable. He's, he's a veteran. He's a veteran coach. Been around a long time, and he knows the blueprint in Arkansas. He knows what it needs to look like day to day to get them where they need to be. My one concern, I think I've talked to you guys, is just year two, sometimes when year one is better than people thought, the expectation is, well, that's just the starting point now for year two. And sometimes that's not the way it works. I think they're going to be a solid football team. Don't don't misunderstand me, but sometimes year one does not tell you exactly what you think it's telling you about the second year. Yeah, well, and plus, I mean... <laughs> They're still facing the toughest schedule in the country for the second year in a row. I mean, you get Texas, you know, you still get the SEC West schedule. You got Georgia as a crossover. Yep. I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be difficult to, like, you're going to have to go by the eye test sometimes on, on if the team improved. Yeah, you want to point to wins, but, I mean, this team is still facing an incredibly difficult schedule again. Oh, by the way, guys, next time you have me on, only refer to me as host. Don't call me Bill <laughs> anymore, okay? That's offensive. It, Bill, if that's what you want to be called, I will call you that. I will call you host because I have respect for you, Bill. You, you've earned that type of respect for me. I will call you. I will call you Grandmaster Host if you'd like. Bill, I'm going to keep calling you Bill, Mister King, if you ask nicely. Okay. All right. See you again. Thank you. That's, that's Bill King from Nashville Sports Radio. Mister King, for those who are a little bit, I guess, younger than me. Hey, if you're looking for something to do with the kids, July 30th, July 31st, all ages are welcome at the Peacemaker Festival. Peacemakerfest.com for tickets. Park gates open 5 p.m. Friday, 4 p.m. Saturday. Rain or shine event featuring some outstanding acts. Cody Johnson, Paul Coffin, Muscadine Bloodline, Giovanni on the Hired Guns. Band of Heathens, much more. This is right there, downtown Fort Smith at the Riverfront Amphitheater. Check out the Peacemaker Festival on Facebook and Instagram for pics and videos. Peacemaker Festival is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. They donated over $100,000 to local nonprofits in 2020. That's peacemakerfest.com for tickets and more information. Wrapping up halftime next, stay with us.